With the rules package, the House can now finally get down to business, and that includes the structuring of committees. Thanks to one motion of that rules package we've been talking about, the Judiciary Committee will now include a sub-panel with access to any ongoing federal criminal investigations. Mm, seems fishy to me. At least one Democratic aide warned NBC News that the Judiciary Committee's work would be, quote, Benghazi on steroids. Committees will also begin, begin executing Republican campaign promises to investigate any and all facets of President Joe Biden's administration and even his family. Now, while all of this drama is going on in Congress, President Biden wrapped up a trip to the southern border and to Mexico for the North American Leaders Summit, where he met with Mexico's President López Obrador and Canada's Prime Minister Trudeau. The trio announced joint efforts to increase semiconductor manufacturing, to boost information sharing on trafficking of lethal drugs like fentanyl, and committing to reduce methane emissions from the waste sector by at least 15 percent by 2030. But all eyes were on his first trip to the southern border as president, where President Biden re reviewed enforcement operations and he spoke to local officials in El Paso, Texas. This is as the administration continues to navigate the humanitarian crisis along the U.S.-Mexico border. The Biden administration has committed to increasing legal pathways for up to 30,000 people a month uh, who are fleeing violence from Cuba, Haiti, Nicaragua, and Venezuela. And they've also turned back thousands of others from those countries to Mexico. That's only if they don't meet the requirements of the program. Here to discuss all of this and more is a deputy chair of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, Congressman Adriano Espaillat, joins me now. Welcome to you, sir. Uh, I, I want to start where I ended here. You recently told Roll Call that while the Biden administration's approach was a quote-unquote beginning, um, it could have been stronger had the administration reached out to lawmakers representing border communities. So what would this policy have looked like if the administration had consulted uh, those members, like you suggested? Well, first of all, uh, thank you for having me. And I'm glad to see that the president did visit the border this, this weekend and spoke to members that represent border districts. I think it's important uh, to keep them engaged. Uh, they're on the ground, and they know exactly what's going on in those districts. Uh, having said that, I think uh, had they discussed this before, it would have been stronger in many ways. Uh, there is a crisis of democracy in the, in the Americas. We saw what happened this weekend in Brazil. We see what's happening, 46 uh, dead, dead folks in Peru. Uh, we see a uh, crisis in Nicaragua. We see Cuba showing up at the border. So there is a Haiti. There is a crisis of the Americas, uh, and we must address that. But in addition to that, I think that we must continue to uh, offer to traditional asylum seekers a path uh, to America. Those that are fleeing uh, authoritarian regimes, you know, right now what, it, what the Biden administration proposed calls for a sponsor, probably a family mm -hmm. member, to be in the United States. But if you flee violence— In addition to violence, a background check, right? Uh, that's correct. So if you flee violence or a, a government, uh, a ruthless uh, authoritarian government, uh, and you don't have a family member in the United States, uh, it's going to be very difficult difficult for you to seek asylum. That's what the, the asylum program has been traditional. So I think that it could have been made stronger that way. But I'm happy that he's having a conversation with Lopez Obrador and Prime Minister Trudeau. It shows that the three large countries in the Americas are finally uh, coming together to address the crisis at the border and a crisis of democracies in Central and South America and the Caribbean. In addition to um, uh, being briefed from administration officials, uh, uh, the cabinet secretary, DHS secretary Mayorkas, was also in a number of these briefings with lawmakers. You also had an opportunity to express concerns directly to Secretary Mayorkas. What were those concerns to him specifically? Well, first, let me tell you that uh, we have the highest respect for Secretary Mayorka. I think he's probably one of the most sensitive and uh, secretaries that we had in Homeland Security ever. He shows empathy for families, women and children that are crossing the border the way we should be as Americans. And so we have the highest uh, opinion of him, and we look forward to working with him, but I did express to him that we must have an ongoing dialogue with the Department of Homeland Security to ensure that we address the crisis at the border, which ultimately uh, comes to my district. It comes to New York City, and it comes to cities across the United States. So we're looking to work together with him to address it. 
All right, we will be watching uh, that as well, sir, and I know we'll be speaking soon as this all unfolds. I, I want to move to the recently passed rules package. That rules package is going to pave the way for a committee on the so-called weaponization of the federal government. Now, this particular committee, as I understand it, is shaping up to be a committee that is a counter to criminal investigations into Donald Trump and his allies. Uh, how concerned are you about those investigations, um, particularly if they will be interrupted or if they'll be sabotaged? It is concerning that uh, just a couple of days into their majority, their fragile majority, I may add, that the, Republican, uh, the Republicans are looking uh, to get on the way of law enforcement and to really, uh, uh, really interfere with what should be uh, very transparent and very equitable investigations by law enforcement. They're the party that claims that we're, you know, that we Democrats are soft on crime and that we underestimate and also try to handcuff uh, law enforcement. In this case, they're the ones that are interfering with what I think is uh, justifiable uh, investigations that most, must proceed in many cases and we must look into. Two of your New York Democratic colleagues, um, Congressman Richie Torres and Congressman Daniel Goldman, they have called for the George Santos, again, a Republican congressman from New York, to be investigated um, by the Office of, uh, pardon me, by the Ethics Committee. Um, they have dropped off a copy of their complaint to that committee against him. Your response to this, sir? Well, certainly uh, this member, this new member is engulfed in a series of uh, crises and scandals already, not just exclusively here in the United States, but I may add abroad in Brazil as well. Uh, there may be uh, criminal proceedings opening up against him there. Uh, and as such, I think he's compromised. So we sh at the very least, he should not access classified information. To have uh, this gentleman uh, have access to classify information that may put uh, the security of the American people in jeopardy, I think, should not happen. He should not be allowed to have access to classify information as the Ethics Committee continues to investigate uh, the charges. Congressman Espaya, I know we have to go, but I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about the revelations of classified documents being found um, in an uh, office of former uh, then, uh, then Vice President Biden, now President Biden's uh, off can uh, off-campus Penn Center office. Uh, your response to criticism from Republicans equating this to Donald Trump and Mar-a-Lago? I think intent is, is an important uh, uh, char characteristics of this. And uh, what was, was it uh, simply a mistake or was it uh, there was uh, some clear intent for that to be there? I think is the core issue. And clearly, regarding Mar Mar a Lago, there was uh, an intent by former President Trump to access this classified information and do with it, we don't know uh, whether he uh, wanted to weaponize them against uh, the Democratic Party or maybe even share them with another uh, government. Mm. All right. Congressman Adriano Espaillat, thank you very much, sir, for your time. Good to see you. Thank you. I now want to bring in a brand new congresswoman. I'm talking about Congresswoman Sydney Kamlager. She is a Democrat from California. Congratulations to you, ma'am, on your swearing in. Even though it was delayed quite a few days, uh, you made it. I, uh, I, I, what I want to get into uh, the L.A. Times, actually, because you were recently interviewed by them, and you talked about being a new member. Uh, in, that, in your article, you talked to your predecessor. It talks about your predecessor, Karen Bass, who is now the current mayor of Los Angeles. And um, she's texting you, and you kind of, and the text message is, What's happening? This is incredible, so much drama from the mayor. And you responded, I don't know. This was, I, don't, I didn't know this was what I was getting into. Uh, you call it chaos. Talk to me about the chaos. Well, thank you so much for having me uh, on your show again. Uh, you know, I'm a huge fan of uh, Mayor Karen Bass, grateful that she thought I was up to the task of uh, being in Congress. And while this was unfolding, essentially 14 votes of no confidence for Kevin McCarthy to be our next speaker, she started texting me saying, this is incredible. Who are these other people that they are nominating? What is going on? It was chaos. It was confusion. It showed that America was in crisis. And ultimately, with the 15th vote, 
Uh, Kevin McCarthy, our new speaker, has tethered himself to the extreme right MAGA Republican agenda. Are you concerned about the Republicans' ability to govern, or Speaker McCarthy specifically, his ability to keep his caucus together, given the chaos that you just described? Yes. In my experience, when you vote for a speaker, you vote for someone that you trust. For folks that don't know, you've previously served in the California uh, General Assembly. Correct. Yes. And so you want someone who's going to have your back that you believe in. 14 votes of no confidence to me says, I don't trust you. Mm. That means that calls into question if someone can lead, if they can govern, and ultimately if they care more about trying to get the gavel or working on behalf of the American people. Well, let's talk about the work of the American people, because one of the first orders of business was to cut funding for the Internal Revenue Service, the IRS. Now, uh, they claimed that the IRS was going to hire 87, all, all of these agents that are going to go after middle-class Americans. This is something um, that uh, Republicans have been talking about, I would argue, for the last six months, and it's a, it's a falsehood. It's absolutely not true. Um, why do you believe that Republicans made this such a high priority? Uh, and, and what is the response from Democrats, right? Because there are things that the American people would like Congress to do as it relates to them for their needs. I think the American people want Congress to make sure that more dollars are going into our pockets. There are so many folks living in poverty. We have a lot of work to address child poverty and adult poverty. Going after the IRS, I think, is so choice, given the fact that Donald Trump is being investigated and he hasn't paid taxes. I think $750 one year and zero mm -hmm. another. We know that the IRS has over-audited poorest communities in this country. And they don't audit those who are wealthy enough to have really complex IRS statements to really complicate the work of the agents. And so what we were saying was, let's have more agents on board so that they can audit folks who are rich who've been scamming the government. I think it was the pinnacle of corruption to have Donald Trump on the floor calling members, asking members to support a speaker mm. that is saying he is going to stop the investigation into the criminal activities of Donald Trump. Mm, well, uh, that, that we're going to leave that where that <laughs> is. And I, I think there are a lot of people out there that would agree with you on that. But I, I also want to get your response to uh, what I spoke to Congressman Espaillat about. Particularly, uh, we talk about investigations and whatnot. There are ne we, are, we now know that apparently there were classified documents found uh, at a private office that President Biden used when he well, after he left office as vice president. Um, uh, what is your response to this? Because there are Republicans out there saying, look, this is exactly like uh, Donald Trump. And where is the investigation of Joe Biden? Now, uh, it is not the same. But what are your—what is your response as a member of Congress? Because um, I could imagine this is something that the Republican caucus is going to pounce on. Of course. It is not the same. Intent is important. What we know is they want to have a select committee on the strategic competition between the United States and communist China. Mm -hmm. That work has already been done through the Competes Act, through uh, the CHIPS Act. And this is really their opportunity to legitimize xenophobia. We know that they want to have the select committee on the weaponization of the FBI, really in response to what's been happening to FBI to Donald Trump and probably some other members of con Congress. This is a distraction point. This is a distraction point so that folks are forgetting about what we have had to go through for the past four years and focus on the president. And we don't need that. What we need to do is be focusing on how we can help the American people. And witch hunts does not help the American people. All right. We're going to have to leave it there. Congresswoman Sidney Kamlager, thank you very, very much for coming in today. Appreciate your thank time. Thank you. Thank you.